शिव शक्तुक्त यदि शक्त प्रभावित न चेदेव देव न खलु कुशल स्पंदी अथस्वाध्यंग हरिहर विरिंचादिरपी प्रणंतुम स्तोतुम वाकतमकृतपुण्या प्रभवती Namaste. So last time we looked at the scriptural support for the theory of the grantis, the knots. And these knots correspond with the intervals between the chakras. And later on we'll show in detail how this works, how it fits with the regular chakra system and so on. But this time I want to introduce some evidence from another scripture, the Saundarya Lahari. Saundarya Lahari was written by Shankaracharya, and it's a wonderful poem, a hundred verses or 101 verses in some recensions, about Shakti, and it contains the description of the Kundalini and the Kunda path. So I will read these two verses. Mahing mula dhare kamapi mani pure hutavahang Stitang svadhishtane hridi marutam akasha mupari Mano pi bhru madye sakalamapi bhitva kulapatang Sahasrare padme saharahasi patya viharase Thou art diverting thyself in secrecy with thy Lord in the thousand-petaled lotus, having pierced through the earth situated in the Muladhara chakra, the water in the Manipura chakra, the fire in the Svadhisthana chakra, the air in the heart, Anahata chakra, the ether above, Vishuddhi chakra, and Manas between the eyebrows, Agnya Chakra, and thus broken through the entire Kula path. And the next verse. Sudhadhara Saraish Charana Yugalantar Vigalitaihi Prapanchang Sinchanti Punarapi Rasam Naya Mahasaha Avapya Swang Bhuming Bujaganibab Adjushta Valayam Swamatmanam Kritva Svapishikula Kunde Kuharini. Having filled the pathway of the Nadis with the streaming shower of nectar flowing from thy two feet, having resumed thine own position from out of the resplendent lunar regions, and thyself assuming the form of a serpent of three and a half coils. Thou sleepest in the hollow of the Kula Kunda. So these two verses describe, in a very condensed form, the entire theory of Kundalini Yoga. And this also corresponds with the uh, four views, uh, four views and three grantis equals seven, seven chakras. So we will show in succeeding videos how this whole system works, how the whole path fits together and its dynamic aspect as well. So this is the path that I followed in my life. Uh, in the very early stages of my sadhana, I did a deep study of the I Ching. And the I Ching, as you probably know, consists of six lines. Uh, and each line can be either yin or yang. 
either contracting or expanding, either still or dynamic. So the different hexagrams of the I Ching are pictures of the chakras and whether they're in a yin or a yang or changing state. And of course, this gives a clue into the situation, the consciousness and the feelings that we're having in the moment. So it's a wonderful oracle and it really works. You should try it. But anyway, the second hexagram of the I Ching is called Kun. And this hexagram, as you can see here, is all yin lines. And this energy flow is going up through all the six chakras right to the Sahasrara at the top of the head without any obstruction. So what does this mean? When the chakras are in a yang state, when they're expanding, when they're going out into the world through the senses, the natural ascent of the Kundalini is blocked. And so the life energy, attention, consciousness, etc., flows out through the senses toward the world. And we experience the world as being real and so on. But when the chakras are in a yin state, when they're contracting, turned inwards, this is meditation. And the better we get, the more skillful we become at this meditation, the more we can withdraw our energy within. And then we find something very wonderful. The uh, Sufi literature calls this the inner woman, also some of the tantras. The inner woman means the kundalini, and the kundalini means Devi, the goddess, Tripura, the life force, kundalini. So when the kundalini, when all the blocks are removed, means when all of our identifications and attachments and delusions of ignorance are removed, then the natural flow of the life energy is restored and the kundalini can rise to the top of the head and uh, uh, become in union with Shiva. Shiva means the natural, original, uh, completely pure awareness without an object. When the only object of the Shiva is kundalini, then a state of ecstasy ensues. And actually, all the happiness that we experience in life is the result of this process. But because of our identifications with the body, the senses, the world, the mind, and all this junk, <laughs> because it's temporary, huh? we perceive those things as being real and being the source of our happiness. But actually, the happiness is coming from within. And the proof of that is when we are successful in meditation and Shiva and Shakti can join in the Sahasrara and then the wonderful ecstasy is released. This happened to me in 1984. I got this blessing from Shakti. The kundalini raised spontaneously. Yeah, well, after six weeks of intense meditation. <laughs> but the point is, I wasn't trying to do it. I wasn't trying to do anything. I was just sitting and watching, being. So in that state of pure being or pure awareness, uh, without trying to do anything, without trying to change anything or make anything happen, then all the chakras go into their yin state. The kula path opens up and the kundalini rises to the top. Now, 
in all the three preliminary stages, the Dvaita Vada, Vishishta Dvaita Vada, and Vivarta Vada, the uh, relationship between the jiva and the goddess is one of mother and child. She is the mother, she is the origin, she is the creatrix of the universe, and we are her dear child, uh, our dear, her dear children, and we are trying to please her in various ways to get her benedictions. However, when the locus of energy reaches the Sahasrara, one realizes Shivoham, I am Shiva. Then the relationship changes and the Shakti becomes not the mother but the lover, the beloved. Uh, so the lover and beloved merge in union, in ec ecstatic samadhi in the Sahasrara Chakra. And this is the complete self-realization. Now, anyone can experience this. Huh? It's easy to do. It just takes time. In fact, it's so easy that almost nobody can do it because we're all so conditioned by the idea of being the doer. So we think we have to go out and make a big effort and so on. No, actually what we have to do is drop all effort. Drop all seeking. Drop the very concept of being the doer. And then the kundalini will naturally... See, the kundalini energy has her own intelligence. It's not like physics where everything is just dumb particles uh, running around uh, by chance. No. <laughs> kundalini is intelligent. She is Mother Nature. She has created this whole wonderful universe that shows everywhere the signs of her artistic designs. So how could she be without intelligence? The scientists are, are actually, they're the ones without intelligence. <laughs> because the experience of Kundalini Shakti is subjective. And by throwing out all subjective experience, the scientists, well, actually they become hypocrites. Because even their uh, so-called objective experiments uh, are actually perceived subjectively. There's no way around it. Experience is ineluctably subject subjective. There's nothing you can do about it. There is no objectivity. It's just an imaginary thing. Huh? It's an imaginary model of the world that we build in our minds. Our actual experience is only subjective. And I know I've given this example so many times before, but a married couple came into the temple where I was serving as a pujari one day, and they, they wanted to make an offering to the deities. So, okay, I took their offering and I went to the deities and I'm doing the puja and all like that. And they're standing there, married couple, right? She is in ecstasy. She is like in bhakti. Wow. You know, and he's like tapping his foot, looking at his watch. You know, when are we going to get out of here? <laughs> so here are two people having the very same experience, standing right next to each other. Huh? Married couple. They should know each other better than anybody else in the world. Yet, they're having two completely different experiences of the same thing. That's only because experience is subjective. And it depends, it changes depending on the values that we give it. So, it's up to us. Are we going to be in heaven or hell? Are we going to be in ignorance or enlightenment? Are we going to go to heaven after death? Or are we going to come back again and have to go through all this nonsense? It's up to us. It's totally up to us because we are the ones who determine the state of our chakras. 
Well, we are the ones who determine the priorities and the importance. See, just like I'm, I've been looking for years, I mean decades, for someone who I can practice Tantra with. I practice, you know, some pretty radical Tantra, I admit. It's out there, okay? But I haven't been able to find anyone who's actually dedicated to this path. They all have some outside interest. They all have some agenda. They all have some attachments. So I haven't found anybody who can fly with me. Huh? I always wind up leaving them behind because they're just not ready. So, oh well. <laughs> I'm experiencing ecstasy. So, if I can't share that with anybody in this world, I'll just go find a world where I can, you know. And I do, and I have, and I will. <laughs> so, this Kundalini Yoga is really the ultimate secret of the Vedas. This Sri Vidya, which encompasses such a huge context of different uh, levels of spiritual awareness and progress, is really the greatest spiritual path. I know I said this before, but it bears repeating that every spiritual path, religion, method, or viewpoint that I have ever encountered will fit somewhere in the Sri Vidya. It's such a huge context and it doesn't deny anything. It affirms everything. But it does reveal that most spiritual viewpoints and so on are only partial. Only the Sri Vidya itself spans the entire gamut, the entire spectrum, uh, the entire range of spiritual states from Pashu, animal, animalistic human, all the way to Ajatta, the most highly enlightened sage. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Harihi Aung. <laughs>